Absolutely. The House Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Economic Development, and Lifelong Learning will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair Snyder? Here. Representatives Artis? Here. Carter? Present. Liberati? Here. Curry? Here. Farhat? McKinney? Here. Van Workham? Here. Meerman? Here. Beeson? Here. Alexander? Here. Mr. Chairman, Majority Member of the President, you have a Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Martis moves to approve the minutes from the subcommittee meeting on February 15th. Without objection, the minutes are approved. And Vice Chair Van Workham moves to approve the minutes from February 22nd. Without, a minute, or without objection, the minutes are approved. At this time, we are going to hear a couple presentations this morning, but I will point out that we uh, do have a hard stop this morning. We will be wrapping up by 10. But first, we do have a presentation from the Michigan State Land Bank Authority. And joining us is Director Joseph Ribbett. And uh, Joshana Hicks is back with us once again because she just can't get enough of us, the Legislative Affairs uh, Director from Leo. So Director Ribbett, welcome back to the Michigan House. And the floor is yours. Good morning, um, Chair Snyder and committee members. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Again, my name is Jay Shana Hicks, and I am the Legislative Director for the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Um, here with me today is Joseph Rivett, who is the Executive Director for the Michigan State Land Bank Authority. Um, today, Joseph is going to share some highlights of the agency and also um, kind of give you an overview of our process and some of our most recent efforts that we're proud of. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to go through some, uh, some fundamentals, as it were, and then talk about some of the unique activities that we're undertaking at the land bank and why we merit your continued support of our meager budget. Uh, so, Jay Shanna, thanks. Um, so, first of all, um, land bank properties um, are properties nobody else wants, right? Uh, they are usually blighted or derelict, tax reverted, surplus, contaminated. And so we at the land bank end up with these properties, and it's our mission to repurpose and um, make them productive again. And we measure that, of course, by uh, getting them back on the tax rolls. Um, we know that these properties um, uh, have a carrying cost for communities, right? Um, th they cost to be sitting in the condition they are, so we know we provide a valuable service both to our communities and the state in general. Land banking, uh, just 101, obviously, it's the, the practice of aggregating real estate for future development. And our land banks are quasi-governmental entities managing and repurposing these vacant, abandoned, foreclosed, and surplus lands. Believe it or not, sometimes we have to remind people land banks are not financial institutions. Um, they are simply repositories of, of land itself. Um, but we have to clarify that more often than you think. Uh, we rely on partnerships with our local land banks. Uh, there are 51 across the state, um, the city of Detroit, and then 50 county land banks. Um, they do the same job we do, but they're local, close to their communities, and better able to serve them. We have intergovernmental agreements with all of them, and uh, we work closely and monitor them. We have annual reports provided by our local land banks, um, and so we have a, a very successful and beneficial partnership. So Act 258 of 2003, 20 years ago, I want to point out was passed unanimously by both chambers of this legislature. That used to happen, believe it or not. Uh, um, and it provided us uh, the ability to, to do our jobs, to complete our mission. And these powers that are listed, um, acquire, hold, lease property, um, convey easements, operate, lease, uh, quiet title, um, all these are essential for us to be successful and be able to do our job. A couple of, uh, the, la the last two items are also essential. We do not pay either uh, property tax or special assessments. 
Land banks, these are properties that don't pay taxes usually. We don't have a, a budget for it. We don't have a funding source to pay taxes, and so that exemption is critical. I will point out that House Bill 4675 and 4679 that further clarify that specific uh, exemption is sitting on the House floor. I would appreciate action any day. Um, uh, so those passed out of uh, tax uh, in the fall. And finally, we're TIF eligible, uh, tax increment financing. It's a tool that we use to be able to, uh, to do our jobs. Land, land banks can't do a few things. We might have skipped ahead of slide. Um, and we think this is important, right? We are not a government. We cannot uh, exercise eminent domain or condemnation. We cannot levy tax. We also can't do anything related to casinos because in 2003, I was around. Casinos were a hot topic, so we didn't, I think we put no casino activity in just about every bill we passed. Um, so it's important to note that we are not a government entity. We're an agency that just has a specific mission and, and we do our best to uh, try and accomplish that mission. <clears throat> the budget highlights are limited, right? We get $2, two million ongoing, GF. Uh, I wanna point out that that does not pay for our office and maintenance. So we have to maintain about 700 sites, cut the grass, clean them up, plow the snow, and plus our small staff of nine. So that $2 million does not even provide for our operation on an annual basis. We look at other funding sources. So if we have a property inventory we sell, we can keep that money. Uh, and we also have the ability to capture some tax in what we call our 550 tax capture. Not unlike any other tax increment financing, if we sell a piece and there's a development, we can capture the growth, tax growth, for uh, five years, 50% of that tax growth. So these are just mechanisms that we have at our disposal to be able to continue our mission, given in the limited funding that we're um, provided by the state. Just some uh, statistics on what we've done. Over 3,300 uh, properties have been demolished and cleaned up. Uh, we've put 2,600 parcels back on the tax rolls, which is obviously our goal and mission. And we currently um, manage about 2,500 parcels. We're just under 2,500 as we speak today. I do want to point out one thing. Uh, we dispose of property. When we get rid of property or sell property, it's not a typical real estate transaction. Uh, we have found that um, there's too much speculation, right? So people will grab up these $100, $500 pieces of property and then do nothing with them. They go back on the tax roll and, we, and they're right back to where we were, right? So our disposition process is done in a way that we vet all the applications, we make sure there's a development plan, and we make sure that we're not gonna end up with this property right back in our inventory in three to five years. So we have a, a, a re re relatively rigorous process for moving our property. And we think that ultimately serves the state and the communities that we work in. Uh, thanks to you all, PA1, 2023, 166 of 2022, you gave us $150 million for blight elimination. Um, we broke that into four rounds, obviously 75 million GF and 75 in ARPA. Uh, we broke that into four rounds. We made sure that each land bank was uh, uh, allocated some money and we put money in each prosperity region to be as, uh, um, as diverse as possible in our expenditures. And then the last couple of rounds were competitive. We allocated our last um, funding of about 29.5 million last week. Um, so we're now in the process of administering and making sure those projects are getting accomplished. Um, we were able to do a little uh, environmental remediation in the first two rounds with the GF money, but the ARPA money is a little more restrictive, so we can only do demolition, rehabilitation, and stabilization. Okay, so that's land banking, what we call 1.0. Uh, but we at the State Land Bank are moving into what we like to call our land banking 2.0, and that is becoming a community development partner uh, for both the state and our communities. And so. If you sort of revisit the tools and powers that we were granted in the uh, Fast Track Land Bank Authority Act 20 years ago, you can start to see the possibilities that exist for us to become a partner in community development. And when I say partner, we value and, and put, great, uh, put a lot of attention on our relationships with local units and our partners in the field. Um, and because we know we will not be successful unless that relationship is strong and that we're working together. 
So <clears throat> if you look at these tools, you know, whether it's holding property for uh, a, a period of time so that you can bid, put a bigger development together or utilizing tax increment financing, getting title squared away, all these things can be very valuable in an overall economic development effort or specific project. So that's our new goal. We want to utilize our tools and be creative and nimble uh, to move development forward in the state. So here's one example. We had little money left over in our fund balance. We created what we call our Emerging Developer Housing Loan Program, where we provide sort of startup or gap funding for new developers uh, to be able to create projects. We lean pretty heavily on housing projects, um, and, and we loan that money out for a year, 18 months, until they get their financing together, and, and they can get enough inertia to begin to move their projects. We got two outstanding right now, one's up in Munising. We're doing a sort of a downtown firehouse rehabilitation with a, a significant uh, housing piece. And we're working with, uh, we just closed last week with a new developer in Detroit, New Era. Um, they're gonna take three uh, land bank properties from the city of Detroit, Detroit Land Bank Authority, and develop 12 condominiums. So our funding piece is essential to get the ball rolling, to get those projects moving. So that's one sort of innovative thing we're trying to do. <clears throat> the Deerfield Riverside Correction Site, another, another unique opportunity. We, 160-acre uh, former prison site, state of Michigan, surplus property, we ended up with it. We're using blight elimination program dollars to clean it up, uh, and, but we don't stop there. So we have partnered with the city of Ionia. We have uh, created an RFP for housing development, went out, solicited, found a developer, and are in process of creating a development agreement with that developer, with the city and us, to develop 80 acres of new housing in the city of Ionia, right? So utilizing our tax increment financing and our expertise uh, in our partnerships, we're gonna have a housing development in the city of Ionia, probably starting next year. Another sort of unique circumstance we're in, city of Highland Park, we have over 300 parcels in the city of Highland Park in our inventory alone. There are 2,600 publicly owned parcels in the city of Highland Park. Uh, we know that uh, over the last few years, we haven't been successful in our disposition efforts in the city of Highland Park. So, you know, we're trying a new approach and we have a urban uh, planner and landscape architect on, on staff. And, and we've sort of played around with the idea of creating a, a development plan for the city. This is uh, what we call our infill housing development plan. Um, we are approaching the city of Highland Park and others, uh, obviously the city of Highland Park with one there's there's a number of factors involved there but we're <clears throat> we're doing our best to be creative and get enough um, momentum to be able to start some development in the city of Highland Park that's another example of sort of the interesting and diverse work we're doing nobody wants landfills or contaminated sites so the land bank ends up with them uh, you can't do a whole lot with a landfill or a contaminated site so we're looking at alternative energy development on those sites here's two examples uh, Wayne County down in uh, Flat Rock, uh, we just signed a development agreement on a, a Part 201 or polluted site for battery storage. We have that development agreement uh, inked. Uh, we expect that to move forward over the next couple of years. Uh, up in Macomb County, we, we have a landfill. Um, obviously, you can't put houses on a landfill, so we are almost, we're, we're at the final stages of a development agreement to uh, put solar on that, that landfill. So. Again, innovative ideas. We can do very little things with these contaminated sites. We're coming up with new approaches to be able to see development, get some industrial uh, facilities, personal property tax for that community so they can capture some, some revenue and enhance that community. Um, <clears throat> so those are a couple of examples. We know housing is critical to this administration, this state. We're still trying to find 75,000 new units. And I just wanted to give you a, two or th a few examples of stuff that we've done at the State Land Bank, uh, sort of new, new uh, territory, innovative approach to housing development. City of Nuevo and their uh, uh, Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, uh, we partnered with them and we created sort of the first housing TIF. Last year, the legislature uh, approved housing TIFs um, for housing development across the state that MISHTA is gonna start to utilize more often. We did it last year, right? We had that tool in place. So we created this 16-acre uh, housing development. Um, and it, is, um, uh, it was our TIF dollars 
that provided the, you know, the inertia to do the infrastructure to make the project affordable and, and, and available to that community. So partnered with them and uh, we have a, a successful new subdivision development in Nuego. Next uh, project is uh, City of Holland Park Vista Place. This is a partnership with uh, Jubilee Ministries and Habitat for Humanity. Uh, what we did a similar sort of thing, but this is attainable, affordable housing. Um, uh, under 120% AMI, we, I think it's actually between 30 and 100. Modular home development, again, unique approach, uh, utilizing our tools and partnerships to provide attainable housing in the city of Holland. Here's a whole different one that we came up with and were able to accomplish last year. This is the Commerce Tar Township uh, project in, in uh, Oakland County. This was an old gravel mine, old sand pit. It was just property that was, that was unused, just sitting there, no, no idea what to do with it. We partnered with the uh, uh, Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and a uh, successful residential developer in Oakland County, and we developed this 200 uh, lot subdivision on an old gravel mine. So um, uh, this is market rate, so we know the tax base generated from this project is gonna be significant for that community and Oakland County. Uh, but we always recognize our mission, so we negotiated as part of this overall agreement $400,000 to the uh, Oakland, County, Oakland County Housing Trust Fund to support attainable housing in Oakland County. So even when we have a project that is not um, gonna be able to provide attainable or affordable housing, we know it's only gonna be successful when it's uh, market rate housing, we're able to find ways to support attainable and affordable housing in the communities that we operate in. City of Brighton, completely different project, right? Completely different vision, completely different frame. They had a problem with parking and, um, and um, uh, housing in downtown Brighton. We've partnered with a, a successful developer, the City of Brighton, the Brighton DDA, and we are uh, very close uh, to, well, we have some initial development agreements not finalized, some tentative agreements have been signed, 158 residential units and 600 parking spaces, utilizing the tools of the State Land Bank to be able to make the project successful. So completely different project, completely different frame, but another success that we have uh, partnering in the State Land Bank. And the final one I'll mention is uh, the 2080 Union Project in the city of Grand Rapids. 42 single family uh, homes. What's innovative about this, it's a partnership with a nonprofit called Dwelling Place, um, but this is a community land trust project. And community land trusts are uh, nonprofits that own the land so that the homeowner only owns the building. And that's important because it makes it more affordable and it, the, the, the trust is able to maintain the attainable or affordable aspect of the housing because they control the land. And so the value of community land trusts are two things. It allows uh, more affordable and attainable housing, but also um, it ensures that this housing is gonna remain attainable long into the future. So this is uh, what we think is gonna be the model for community land trusts across the state and uh, our partnership made it successful. So. Um, I want to thank you for your time again. Uh, all this for a mere two million GF dollars. So uh, we appreciate uh, your ongoing support. Uh, we want to just continue to point out that the land bank is a tremendous tool that you um, you afforded the state of Michigan, and we're doing all we can to be as successful and innovative and nimble as possible on behalf of the citizens of Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Director. I know we. I have a couple questions for you first, uh, Representative Farhat. Thank you, Chairman Snyder uh, and Director Rivett for being here. Uh, I, you know, I want to hone in on uh, this formal gra former former gravel pit uh, that you folks transferred. You know, when, when, when marketing that former property, was there an appeal, was there a demand you felt from the development community to take that property and turn it around? Can you maybe, because you know, we, we always hear about you know, specifically these gravel pits, is there anything, you can, any insight you can offer us from a development standpoint? Well, two, I guess two things from, and, and <clears throat> it was, I came in at the tail end of it, so it was not initially involved in the process, but there, there's two advantages of that particular site, right? One is um, 
it was a, a, a landfill or a, a gravel pit, which is, you know, has its own challenges, obviously. But um, because of where it was located, mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a, a substantially um, greater opportunity for development. So these are market rate homes, right? They're, they're four or $500,000 homes. And so if you, you would, we needed that sort of uh, capital infusion to make that project work. Yeah. Um, and so understanding that the amount of um, capital investment to make that project successful was such that attainable housing was never gonna work. Uh, and so the market housing did work and it was a combination of where it was located and um, the work of the uh, Oakland County um, Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and us. But again, we, we did manage to, to take some money and put it into the housing, Oakland County Housing Trust. Well, that's awesome to hear. So the site was, was a marketable site. There was just some issues that the developers needed fixed out, and that's where you guys came in along with local partners. I think it's fabulous to hear all the great work that the Land Bank is doing right now. I mean, I think it's exciting, uh, especially around the, the area of housing, which is a real big need here in our state. So I want to thank you for it, and thank you for this presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Meerman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, turning to the back page, uh, dwelling the uh, 2080 Union Project. Um, there's a state local land bank there. T tell me, you know, the involvement of the state land bank. Can you do things that they can't do? Currently, uh, Kent County does not have a land bank. Um, and so when a community does not have a land bank, we step in. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a unique uh, um, partnership with uh, an agreement signed with the city of Grand Rapids to act as their land bank. Um, as you know, you, you passed a bill last year, uh, Representative Grant, um, to let municipalities of over 50,000 create their own land bank. So we anticipate the city of Grand Rapids will have their own land bank. Um, but in a circumstance like that, um, we act as the land bank. If there's already a local land bank, we would support, but uh, more often than not, they would take the lead. Now, we do have properties in um, communities that do have our service by land banks, um, but for the most part, we let locals do their thing. But in this particular case, we have an agreement with the city of Grand Rapids on a number of parcels. Uh, that used to belong to the, st the Kent County Land Bank. The Kent County Land Bank is no longer in existence, so we have a unique relationship with the city of Grand Rapids. Thanks. Vice Chair Van Workham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ribbit, for being here. Um, listening to the testimony, um, I guess, one, I'm kind of trying to determine where you guys are with your jurisdiction, where MISHTA is with their jurisdiction and how much maybe there's some duplication here of some of the projects that you have described. But more particularly, um, I, from your testimony, you said we had some money left over, so we created this emerging developer housing loan program. Maybe you can clarify that of how this fund came into place, where that money and where you got the authority to then create this program. Uh, so um, our ongoing funding is um, not consistent, right? And when the land banking uh, bill was passed, um, they wanted to ensure, and remember local land banks are governed by the same statute. So the the 550 tax capture and the ability to hold money for sold properties was done to help f sort of help land banks, not only the state land bank, but local land banks be able to fund their operations, okay? And so <clears throat> um, uh, we also uh, obviously uh, have the authority to maintain those, those funds because as I said, Things got tough, no more state appropriation. The land bank has to survive on its uh, fund balance and also what money it can generate. And that is true for locals as well. And so um, our, uh, those funds that we capture, we can, we can hold, we, we maintain, they don't lapse. And so we, we don't have a, sig we, we try to maintain a couple years of operational revenue uh, in the event our uh, general fund money does not come through, which, as I said, 
it's there than it's not there. Um, but that's, that's where those dollars are. And rather than just let them sit there, we decided to be progressive uh, and innovative and try and move some housing development along. So. so this isn't authorized by anything we have done, the legislature, or by the governor to create this fund, you guys solely determined to create this program? The, the state land bank authority is created under statute, uh, and that authority governs our operation. So technically, I work for the authority appointed by the governor, uh, and they have the ability to authorize my work, the, the land bank staff's work, and um, the use of funds. Uh, the authority is granted that ability. So we work with our board of directors, uh, and they, for instance, approve all these loans, right? So this isn't, um, hey, we, we might know this developer in Detroit, let's throw him some money. Uh, we have a, a significant uh, process, uh, loan process, uh, all kinds of uh, tests. We present that to our board. If they are comfortable with uh, our current cash reserves and our f uh, projected funding, and there's some available dollars that would just you know, frankly be sitting in the bank, we utilize that uh, to try to initiate housing development. In terms of our relationship with Mishta, we are partners. Uh, we too, you know, they're like us, we're, they're an independent authority or agency under the LEO umbrella. I have a, a terrific relationship with Director Hovey. Um, we sort of, um, you know, I guess we sort of clear the land and then they come in and, and develop the, the, the parcels, right? So um, all of our developments, most of our developments um, have had uh, have been touched by MISTA or at least um, been involved in the the MISTA funding process. So I mean, we we use our tools, we complement those with MISTA tools, and we try to get attainable, affordable housing developed across the state of Michigan. All right, thank you so much for your presentation this morning and thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, we'll continue our conversations as the budget process moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, we are gonna have a presentation from the Housing Michigan Coalition and with us today we have a uh, large group, Don Crandall from the Michigan, or the Home Builders Association of Michigan, Josh Lunger from the Grand Rapids Chamber, Jen Rectorink from the Michigan Municipal League, and Kent Wood from Housing North. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Josh Lunger. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Grand Rapids Chamber. Um, and we're really thrilled to be here today, talk a little bit about where we've come from, um, some of the things that this uh, committee had supported our efforts uh, and many across the state last year, and then a brief update on what we're working on, what, so what comes next. Uh, a little bit about our coalition. Um, man, I keep forgetting when we started. I think we started in 2020, and in 2020. Um, and it came forth that we were all having kind of endless conversations about what do we do uh, to make meaningful and measurable progress on housing supply and, and affordability in Michigan. And at some point, we we're just like, we got to stop talking, we got to start taking action. And so uh, the four of us were said, let's just do something different. Let's go through all the networks we're already working on, get ideas in, uh, figure out what has the most consensus, and then try to get it done in the next legislative cycle. Um, and so that was our focus. And then obviously, I just want to highlight why do we care about housing? Um, I think we've got, you've got the home builders, you've got the cities, uh, you've got housing nonprofits, uh, you've got business, um, and then our coalition includes realtors, the Small Business Association, other chambers of commerce, um, developers, nonprofits all across the scale um, and across the state. And um, I think we're all there for mostly the same reasons, that housing is a, um, a real foundational component of community vibrancy. Uh, I got into it first because our employers in West Michigan were saying, we've got these great jobs, but we're seeing a real talent attraction or retention issue. And that was years ago, and it's only gotten tougher um, in the years since. Um, so I'll let Dawn start look, doing a little look back at um, what's coming up. Thanks, Josh. 
Um, so everybody needs housing, but not everybody can attain it. This is a chart our National Association of Home Builders put together. Uh, these are numbers based on 2023 income, and then you look at it, you know, roughly 1.5 million people um, can afford a home from like zero to 150K. And as you start going up that pyramid, you see fewer and fewer um, people in the state able to attain um, housing in the state. So it's a, it's a critical issue um, because everybody needs housing. Um, this is kind of an interesting chart for our uh, single family permit prediction for 2024. Uh, we're predicting almost 14,000 single family permits being pulled. If you look at what was pulled in January of 2023, there were 575 single family permits. Good news is January 2024, uh, we were over that with 748. But just to put that in perspective, um, in 2005, there were roughly 54,721 single family permits pulled in the state. And we went to 2007, there were roughly 15,000. You went to 2009, there were about 6,900 single family permits pulled in the state. And since that point, we've kind of done the, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can up, um, to where this year, if we hit 14,000, you know, will we'll be what our prediction says. And so we clearly are not building enough to fill the need that is needed in the state. Um, housing is economic development, so I'm not going to read through this entire slide, but when you look at what 15,000 uh, single-family homes resulted, it was about $941.1 million in tax revenue. So not only do new homes create tax revenue at the state and local level, they also create job opportunities. And at that same point, that's just year one. Year two, there's always a bump as well in terms of job creation and tax base. So we are economic development as you look at what we're, you know, trying to become an economic destination in the state. Our housing stock is old and is in a moment you will see what else is old in our state. Um, but the obstacles that we see are building material costs. In COVID, we saw lumber double in price. They're starting to come down, but lumber's still expensive, shingles increased. Uh, our builders and our members run into regulatory obstacles. We have a huge workforce need. Interest rates have jumped, so you have people who you know, might want to buy a house, but they're looking at those interest rates and, and they're not. Or you have people who locked in at a really low interest rate a few years ago and they're kind of stuck where they are because they don't want to move and take on a higher interest rate. Um, mortgage rates, inflation, and land costs, and not only land costs, but land availability. Our members are having a very difficult time finding land. So when we look at uh, workforce development in our opportunities, we actually uh, purchase the, the permits, or not permits, but the licensees in the state. And when you look at the member age of our members, um, two kind of the the low end of 18 to 25, we have 65 members in that age range. That's our members, not statewide. You look at the uh, 56 to 65 and the 66 plus in our membership, you're at 1,700. But if you go to the license builder, our non-members, those numbers equate. Like even in the state, there's only 371 members on that, or builders on that low end. And the high end is, again, you know, you're looking at 23,000 people that are going to age out. I always tell kids are going to age out or pine box out one way or another. Um, we have a workforce shortage in our industry. Uh, so one of the things we did with the help of funding is in 2020, we started uh, working with legislators for March's Reading Month, and we have a book called Billy the Builder Bear Builds a House. We provided the books to legislators who wanted to go in and read. But we were also granted funding to get this Build Your Future that went to every student in grades 8 through 12, and this is on all trades, not just ours, um, to start opening the eyes of students that are looking for that career opportunity in the trades, because it's not just our industry, it's all across the board, including Jen's members. We have this conversation all the time. <laughs> Good, thank you. And um, so just to chime in, I'm, I'm Kent Wood. I represent Housing North, a uh, housing nonprofit um, in northern Michigan. They kind of represent the 10-county region uh, in northwest lower Michigan, kind of from Manistee County up to the bridge. Um, I'm going to start talking a little bit, too, about like what, 
what are, you know, what's kind of the price level and the income levels that, that we've been focused on. And, um, you know, to, to do that, I, I mean, you know, we, we just want to, you know, confirm too that, you know, the, 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 the price points, the income levels um, that, are, that are struggling across the state. If you go back to, to Dawn's pyramid scheme there, Pyramid chart. Pyramid chart. Pyramid <laughs> chart. You know, you you know, you 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 see that the 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 bulk of of people, households, families that are struggling to find housing, they are the major part of of your workforce. I don't care what community you're from. Um, if you're a tourism workforce, uh, you know, primarily to to manufacturing to high tech. Um, the bulk of your workforce uh, is is in that income range that is struggling to find housing, whether they're struggling to find you know a little bit more established, tr struggling to find a for purchase home, or struggling to find um, something for for rent. And as as we move on here, this is um, one of my favorite charts right here. I just love this chart because it 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 shows I think pretty simply what these ranges look like and what. What kind of incentives and subsidies exist in these different um, ranges? And so, when we're looking at area median income, um, you know what you what you have to remember here is that when we are when we're talking about people that are making 120 percent of the area median income struggling to find housing, um, you know what that means is is that um, you know you you really look at how much of their budget are they spending on housing. And you really, you want to keep that number under 30%. Uh, because people, households that start paying more than 30% of their income on housing and, and transportation um, really, really start to, to struggle. And so, um, you know, when we, you know, when, when you look at that um, and you start looking at these numbers, that's, that's what we're implying there is that, is that um, you know, if you're making 120% of the area median income, and I'll just throw Grand Traverse County out there um, where, where I live. This, that's going to be on the higher level statewide, but an individual at 120% is about 75000 for an individual or 86000 for a for a couple or for a, a household. So that's, you know, kind of two people making $43,000 per year is what you're looking at. That's 120% area median income in, in Grand Traverse County. And, you know, in, in the past, um, there's, there's really been nothing from, a, um, from an incentive, from a subsidy standpoint, especially in that 80 to 120%. You start getting further down the chart, you know, in your zero to 30, 30 to 60, uh, you know, that's where you had um, a lot of the MISTA programs, a lot of the federal programs um, were, were really aimed at those at those area median income levels, and for good reason, because those are very, very hard to, uh, to, to develop. What's been really exciting to see over the last, let's say, three, four years now, is from you know, the, the industries and groups we represent, to the state, to federal, um, everybody's kind of uh, really started to get around the 120% AMI number and really start making sure that we've got um, you know, programs, incentives in place that, that cover that entire range from 0% up to 120% AMI. Because we have to remember, it's, it's not just the, um, you know, the, the cost of the, the rental or the cost of the housing that we're after. It's can you finance it? We can, we can sit here and say, well, I want to build a development at, for 50% AMI, you know, folks all day long. The question always gets into, can you finance it? In anything that's 120% or below, you are going to struggle to find traditional financing for that. Traditional financiers will say, you know, okay, I will, I'll support you up to a certain level, maybe 70%, but that other 30% of it you're going to have to find on your own. And that's where you start getting into gaps in the financing that, that, that you have to close in order to make, um, you know, most of these projects work. Just for some background, too, that's yeah, okay. Um, you know, in, in Grand Traverse County, northern lower Michigan, our traditional gaps are typically between two and, and five million dollars. Is that is where we normally see that, that gap from for our larger projects that we're looking at? Anything from 
80 units to uh, 120 units. If you're from a larger community, if you're in a community that's doing larger projects, that gap is, is going to be bigger. If you're from a community that has very high land prices, that gap is, is going to be bigger as well. Um, and so I, I did want to mention too, Josh kind of mentioned how we all how we all got together up here, um, which is, is really pretty cool, because what he didn't mention is, you know, it's um, pretty diverse from an industry standpoint. At most states, um, Don and Jen here um, don't even speak. Uh, you know, the, 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 the builders and the local units of government um, do not get along, do not speak, do not work together on, on stuff. Don can confirm that. Um, and so this is, this is really cool. And so when, when we came together, um, you know, as, as Josh mentioned, we tried to figure out, wanted to figure out what, what can we do together. Knowing that there's some differences, what can we all do together? And, you know, we all knew that, that we wanted things that were, that communities could opt into, that they weren't forced on them, uh, that they could control locally, uh, and that were flexible to fit, you know, different, different needs, different AMI price points, different industry types. And so um, along with that, through a lot of your help that have been, you know, that have been, you know, part of the legislature over the last couple years. Um, I think we settled on, uh, you know, seven bills that we started working on. We got four passed, um, two new tools, and then two, um, uh, you know, two bills that expanded existing tools, basically, that would allow up to 120% and allow uh, communities across the state to, to use them as well. And so, um, you know, if you, uh, you don't have to go back to that, my favorite chart, Josh, but if you did, under that 80 to 120 percent now, where it says no, not eligible for assistance, now we've got you know four to five tools uh, in that that communities and, and developers can use across the state. So one of the most important tools that we have access to, or MISHTA has access to, is the Housing and Community Development Fund. So thank you for funding that fund um, and, and making sure it has a funding stream. I'll do a quick, um, you know push here for Senate Bill 293 that's sitting on the House floor. Uh, I know Mishta is not here uh, presenting today, but that is the most flexible dollar that Mishta actually has. And currently that can only, those funds can only be used um, in traditional downtown urban centers. So for be able to support rural housing projects, um, things in non-traditional downtown around housing, we need Senate Bill 293 passed. Um, that also allows that funding to be used up to 120%. Um, area median income. So right now those funds are pretty restricted. Um, and so 293, we need to see, get that done um, to, again, allow that tool to be used and those funds to go to the highest, um, highest needs when it comes to housing. Additional tools, thank you, uh, 2023, 20, uh, passing the amendment to the Brownfield Redevelopment Financing Act that allowed for housing activities to be eligible for tax increment finding capture. Uh, thank you to this um, group as well for the funding in the LEO budget that established the Housing Readiness Grant program. Uh, we do not have a, a, a big slide on it because I thought Mishta was going to be here talking about it, but I want to tell you uh, that funding, that $5 million that was in the budget, uh, Mishta has funded uh, 50 grants already this year out of that money. Um, as of, that was earlier this month, uh, first round of awards, the award grant letter was turned around in 15 days. That's unheard of at the state level. Um, so being able to apply for that funding and hear back so quickly it is amazing. And so we have to give kudos when kudos are deserved and Mishta deserves some kudos on uh, the turnaround time on that. They have funded uh, of the 15 housing partnership regions, they have uh, awarded communities in 14 of those regions. And so again, you're seeing that money is needed across the state and has been, the only region that hasn't um, been awarded is Detroit, and Detroit is its own region. So you can see uh, those are city, villages, and townships um, where these funds are going. And so we appreciate seeing um, this in the budget again this year. Technical assistance is huge. LEO budgets have helped fund um, the how uh, my funding hub capacity is a huge need in our communities uh, to help one um, do zoning reform to streamline processes 
and uh, as everybody has got leaner over the years planning and zoning capacity was one of those first kind of uh, individuals you got rid of and you just gave the additional staff another hat to wear so funding from the leo budgets we have the zoning reform toolkit we have like i said the my funding hub um, the housing data portal uh, we would have put that in here, <laughs> but it is it is a mission tool, but it's out there for communities and developers to make decisions um, that are data driven. Uh, these are two uh, books that we have that communities uh, uh, pattern book homes. These are free source blueprints um, to increase density uh, and put you know things back into communities in those missing teeth in neighborhoods and if you like these then we're telling our members you need to buy right permit these um, and get them done so again leo budget is huge for mishta medc and the state land bank all of those different departments have different tools and um, a lot of times those projects need tools from each of those departments not just one is able to make a project happen and fill gaps so it's critical um, for the housing needs and to continue that support um, in housing thank you so bringing us back to kind of the high level everyone always asks so how do we solve housing I, you know this committee is not going to solve it today uh, hate to break it to you um, this is not scientific but I'm working to try to make it more scientific <laughs> but I, I think it's really helpful uh, representation of um, how far we are behind in terms of need. Uh, we've got good regional data for West Michigan. I know Michigan has some statewide data. Other regions are doing assessments. Um, let's, let's say we're gonna make a minor progress on our overall need over the next, to, from now to 2050. So how do we actually close that gap? And the, the answer is it's, it's pulling all of the different levers. Um, and so it's, it's addressing codes and regulation. Can we make housing cheaper and easier to build uh, by just finding small tweaks to make that over 30, 40 years can help us uh, do that. It's financing and incentives. We had a builder in um, a few weeks ago for a summit that talked about they had to hold a, a project for three years because they couldn't find the financing. And just every month that goes by, they talked about how much that made it harder for them to complete. Thankfully, they were able to, uh, but that's happening uh, at scale across uh, the state. And then land use and zoning. Um, and that's something we've talked about. You, the LEO budget supported that. Uh, I, last I heard, it was already 50 submissions. I want to say that was a few weeks ago. I, I know I was telling communities in Western Michigan, if you haven't submitted uh, and you want to do some zoning and you want the state to help um, cover that cost, uh, you better do it soon because I think that money's going to be gone very soon. Um, and, and how do we get that to move faster? Because really, if we can make uh, create more certainty for builders and communities, um, and the residents around, it's gonna help us scale faster. Um, so what are we working on right now? Um, we'd love to see the, uh, the housing ready communities uh, to continue to be funded going into the next year. I think it's been uh, requested at a million dollars. Um, something we've, we've been pitching, so we've been pitching that fund for several years. We we're really thankful that you helped get it done last year. The other thing we were talking about is how do, again, how do we get innovative, um, pull more levels, get innovative uh, solutions and more people engaged, more funding engaged. Uh, we've talked about an employer housing fund. So if employers are able to invest in qualified employees, their housing through different programs, and we've had language in the budget several times in both, under both Republican and Democratic controlled legislatures, it just never made the final cut. Um, we think we could grow, you could double your money. If you said it's a 50% tax credit on that investment, you can double the money and you can say, does that get more employers directly invested in these outcomes? Because again, what I'm hearing from is employers are struggling and I think there's time now to try to uh, leverage that interest. Um, and then our coalition in general, we're working with the, um, the housing subcommittee in the house with representative Christian Grant, who's the chair. Um, we actually have a coalition call tomorrow we're talking about our uh, proposed legislation. I don't know if we wanna, not everything's finalized. We, our group, as you can guess, has some disagreements. I think uh, that's why I sit between Dawn and Jen sometimes um, because uh, sometimes, you know, the, the private side wants to push a little faster or the, or the local side wants some more control. But we've got some ideas about uh, ways to approach land use and zoning that are more approachable. Um, design and code, there's some code things that other states are doing uh, that absolutely we should take a run at that make uh, designing very approachable projects uh, possible and it could by its nature without incentive without subsidy lower the cost significantly in some types of projects in the uh the state i'm not going to cut you off no I'm go for cut it you off anyhow um so i do have we do have time for two questions and we're going to start with uh rep Meerman. thank you chair um 
I'm just wondering if you can expand a little bit on codes and regulations, you know, kind of where you see that pinch point being, maybe with a couple examples and then a follow-up. Um, are you watching the uh, proposed new energy code, you know, R40 and the ceilings? What would that add to the cost of the home? So I'll, I'll start there. with, <clears throat> I think first do no harm, right? Like, let's make sure that everything we're doing is focused on, um, a bit, you know, I understand there's always a pressure to get things to be more efficient. I know Don will expand on it. Um, one of the things I think I can talk about, I, if, if Representative Grant gets mad at me, I've, I'll fall on the sword later. Um, one of the bills we're going to talk about tomorrow is a single staircase design. It's, it's something that's been done in other states. It's proven to have no impact on, on safety. And if you design it and you let uh, the public safety officials actually help have feedback on the front end, you can do a, a building that is maybe 612 condos that's a single staircase, and you open up 20% of that property to be bedrooms or another unit instead of another staircase. And there's ways to design it that are just as safe as the current practice. And by its nature, you could potentially lower the cost of each of those units by 10, 20, 20%. And little things like that, again, you pull the lever and then you let people go and build over the next 20 years and it has an impact. Um, it's A lot of the things we're gonna be looking at are, are tweaks like that, that again, doesn't solve it tomorrow, but we think are an important step forward for our state. Um, so yes, we are following the energy code. Uh, the department had um, a hearing, I believe, last week. We have presented an alternative hearing on the energy code that gets us to the same uh, energy savings at a third of the cost. Uh, we are waiting to see what the department does with that, but we have, we did a call to action. We had over a thousand of our members um, send in letters opposed to the proposed energy changes as they are right now. Um, and we are, you know, actively engaged with the Bureau of Construction Codes on that and why, why we are R60s, two by sixes. Um, and then if you look at the residential building code that's coming, uh, we're hearing mandated sprinklers in every new home, uh, which would add about $20,000 uh, between all the stuff um, to the cost of a new home. We're already in a housing crisis. Every time you increase the cost of a house by $1,000, uh, you take 5,000 people out of the ability to be in a home. So um, we look at it and say, if we're in a housing crisis right now, uh, increasing the cost of housing really doesn't seem like the right way to go. Thank you for your question. Last question will be from Rep McKinney. Thank you, Chair Snyder. Uh, good morning. Appreciate everybody's testimony here today. Um, you guys highlighted in the presentation uh, the various tools, right, to stabilize communities. Um, build housing, keep people in their homes, things of that nature. But can you expand on how important those tools are? I know, you know, we've been presented with certain proposals to eliminate possibly NEZs, neighborhood enterprise zones in our communities. I live in one. I think it's important to be able to expand that. But can you guys kind of touch on how important these tools are to keep them all together and how they work? Yeah. yeah. So they're very important because different, every project is different and the needs of that project to make it happen. And again, we're talking about affordable, attainable housing. Uh, market rate housing is going to happen um, at the market rate. And so expanding NEZ was very important so that any community across the state could use it. But we did put some guardrails in there so we're not pushing sprawl. So you have existing infrastructure. We're using the capacity that's already there, not building new and then in the end actually adding additional costs that might not be able to be supported in the future. Um, so we are, you know, incentives are one piece. Uh, in, in 2022, the end of 22, when those bills were passed, we're just starting to see those projects starting to use some of these tools. And we'll be able to identify, you know, additional gaps going forward. But housing is huge. And as you heard, Don said, housing is economic development. And I think a lot of times housing is a key piece missing out of some of these larger economic development um, packages that we're talking about. And so I can't stress enough, and maybe if you yeah, want to add too, but we need the flexibility so the projects, we can get the projects done that are needed most in communities. Yeah. Also, Representative, you have to remember too, all of these tools are available for rehabilitating mm -hmm. current, you know, or existing homes and, and, and housing stock. And because you, you run into the same challenge, whether you're building new or whether you're rehabilitating yeah. and trying to keep those costs down, you can rehabilitate the building, but can you, you know, is the cost going to outweigh keeping it at those attainable levels. And these tools allow that to allow you to rehab current stock that's out there and close that gap 
um, that you have uh, in, in order to, to keep that, that stock also attainable. Yeah, I'll just, last thing I'll say, in, as Don wants to, is um, what we liked about Don the tools. Don doesn't get a chance to. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Don. Wow. Um, what, what I like about these things that we've talked about is they're all, they were all locally controlled. They're public-private partnerships. No one's forced to do them. And so it's, it's really, it has to be a win-win. The, the value has to be there for both partners. Um, and I really think this year is gonna, we're going to start to see some of these projects take off and we'll be able to talk about success stories. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So thank you for being here this thank morning. You. And I'll just end on this. Uh, this week I had a phone call from somebody who is a township supervisor in northern Michigan and is also a realtor, and their community applied for one of the uh, grants for the zoning uh, and, you know, was very excited about that. And to hear that firsthand was really uh, about some of the work that we were able to include in last year's budget was, was great. And uh, randomly to hear it when I'm talking about something completely unrelated and for that to come up, it felt, you know, that we are making an impact across the state. So thank you for uh, being here this morning and for your presentation. Seeing no absent members, uh, Representative McKinney moves to adjourn and the committee stands adjourned.